Okay, so uh, thank you for the invitation to have me speak here. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is uh, Scala, obviously. And I'm going to speak about Scala, the simple parts. Uh, and that implies that maybe uh, not all the parts are simple as has been applied by, implied by many others before. So uh, Scala is actually uh, uh, celebrating its 10th anniversary. Uh, so time flies. Uh, ten years ago, there was the first announcement. We would never have dreamed to actually have a language that has so many developers that is so popular now. We can't do that. Uh, so when the announcement came out, is, uh, we said that we uh, uh, have a new language that has three uh, innovations. Uh, so the ones we mentioned were abstract types and mixing compositions that unify ideas from object and module systems. That's something that hasn't had a lot of press. So object and module systems was uh, one of the main uh, uh, important points at the beginning. The second one was pattern matching over class hierarchies unifies functional and object-oriented data access. And it greatly simplifies the processing of XML trees. So XML was very important when, when Scala came out. and was very important industry-wide. It was a time when everybody, IBM uh, and many other companies, uh, announced the language that would have built in XML support because XML was so important. Well, now, of course, times have changed and maybe we can ex replace XML with JSON and in 10 years we can uh, replace it with something else, I would imagine. Uh, but at the time it was very, very, very important. And in particular it was important because it supported pattern matching. So pattern matching is a functional technology and XML was so sort of the showcase because until then the object-oriented dogma, which was very strong, everybody believed in that, was that to say, well, you should put your methods where your data is and object-oriented encapsulation. And uh, if at the time, if you proposed something else, you were a complete heretic. People just said, no, 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 a, you, you, you have it all wrong. So uh, the times have uh, changed quite a bit and, and opinions have changed quite a bit, but at the time it was like that. And it, when XML came out, it was the, the poster child for why functional programming might be useful because you couldn't put methods into an XML tree. It wasn't possible. XML was pure data, but you still had to analyze and parse it, and the pattern matching was very good for that. So that's why XML was sort of at the, at the beginning of Scala. It played a big role, but now it stops. Um, the third one was the flexible syntax and type system enables the construction of advanced libraries and new domain-specific languages. So that sort of uh, shows the, the theme that Scala is a language that has uh, sprouted quite a lot of domain-specific languages on top of it. Okay, so that was the announcement, and 10 years later, <coughs> we, Scala has grown quite a bit. Uh, we now have about 100,000 developers, uh, hard to count, but on the ballpark figure. Uh, more concrete numbers are 200,000 subscribers uh, to the Coursera online courses overall, uh, 13, uh, number 13 in the Red Monk uh, language ratings, which are based on number of GitHub projects and number of Stack Overflow questions. And uh, beyond the numbers, what I think is, is more important, many, many, many successful rollouts and happy users. So this is great to see that so many people find this uh, a language that, uh, that they can express themselves well in and that makes them happy to write code. But on the other hand, Scala is also discussed more controversially maybe than can be expected for a language its age. Uh, and the question, of course, is why? I mean, Scala is uh, probably big, very big, uh, compared to what could be expected 10 years ago, but compared to, say, a truly controversial language uh, like uh, C++ or Java, it's tiny. So why is everybody talking about something that in the big grand scheme of things is so insignificant? Well, I think uh, there are both internal controversies that doesn't help, and then there are the external complaints. The internal controversies are that actually we have quite a few different sub-communities in the Scala language who don't agree what programming in Scala should be. And quite often they uh, really don't see the point of the other communities. There are parts that don't see the point of, of object orientation at all. And there are object-oriented programmers who don't see the point of the uh, fine, or the, the more advanced uh, patterns of functional programming. And the two communities sometimes clash and don't mix. And then there are the external complaints uh, like uh, 
One you hear often is Scala is too academic. Uh, one you hear also often is Scala is sold out to industry. Uh, so what is it? Uh, Scala's types are too hard. That's what you often hear. But another subset of the community says Scala's types are not strict enough. We need more types. We need stronger types. And uh, a lot of people say Scala is everything and the kitchen sink. And that last point is the one that gets me most upset because when I created Scala, that's precisely the opposite of what I wanted to create. I wanted to create something simple, and uh, because the language is a community effort, many people contribute to that, and also for historic reasons, uh, the perception of Scala maybe is sometimes not that. So what I want to do in this talk is go back to the simple parts of Scala, to what I believe the core of Scala is. And I believe this whole controversy is a sign that we haven't made it clear enough what the simple parts of Scala are and what the essence of programming in Scala is. So let's see what uh, the picture so far is. So in most of my talks I had uh, this diagram which says that essentially Scala is a unifier. It unifies object-oriented and functional programming. And with that you got uh, at the same time uh, a unification of essentially scripting languages and systems languages. So Scala can be used as a scripting language. It even won the script bowl at uh, Java 1 one or two times. And uh, it uh, is also, of course, the substrate of very large deployment, millions of lines deployments at Twitter, for instance, and many other companies that use it essentially f as the backbone for uh, their, 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 their whole business. So Scala, in that picture, was meant to be a scalable language, as the name implies already. And if you, if you ask what is scalable, then in fact it, you could say it has two meanings. The first meaning is a direct meaning to say scalable means growable. So Scala is a growable language. It's a language that can more be molded into new languages by adding libraries. These libraries then become domain-specific languages that are part of Scala. And if you want to uh, find out all about growing a language, then by far the best talk about that is Guy Steele's 1998 Uppsala keynote called Growing a Language. If you haven't seen the talk, then by all means do. It's an absolute piece of beauty. Uh, the second meaning that I'm also going to talk about is a language that enables growth, so scalable in the meaning of enabling growth. Uh, that means that the same constructs can be used for small as well as for large systems and that they allow a smooth growth from small to large. So first, growable language. Scala definitely is, has a lot of features that make it a growable language. It has a very flexible syntax, has a flexible type system, has user-definable operators, has higher order functions, implicits, and all these things together make it relatively easy to build new domain-specific languages on top of Scala, and many people have done that. And where this fails, you now have uh, macros, which are uh, still an experimental feature. So uh, strictly speaking, you shouldn't use macros for production use, but uh, that has never held back anyone who really wanted to create his own syntax and language. So a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon and used macros to create even more refined and uh, advanced domain-specific languages on top of Scala. So that has indeed led to quite a lot of uh, interesting and successful domain-specific languages that we have here. So there's Chisel for hardware, there's of course Spark for big data, uh, there's Spray for HTTP dispatch, there are Shapeless and Scala Z libraries that essentially do lift Scala on the level to, to the level of type level programming. Uh, there's Slick for database access, so Squirrel as an alternative. There's Specs and Scala Test for testing. There's Akka for actors, Dispatch, another HTTP dispatch library. And there's SBT, which is essentially a DScala build tool that uses Scala as the language for writing a build. So definitely this uh, uh, idea of growable has worked out. Uh, there, there are a lot of DSLs on top of Scala, and that's, of course, just uh, an, a sample. There are many, many more uh, that, that I couldn't fit on the slide here. But is growable good? Is it always good? Well, in fact, I believe it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, definitely it lets you gives you the freedom to express yourself, to move the language into new fields, and that's great. But on the other hand, it also can fracture the user community. There's an uh, essay that I personally uh, 
found very good that we definitely rang a bell with me, which is called the Lisp curse, to say, well, why, if Lisp is another very growable language, uh, but the Lisp curse is essentially that precisely this property leads to a fractioning of the, of the user community. Uh, besides, of course, no domain-specific language is liked by everyone, uh, like, just like no uh, general-purpose language is liked by everyone. Uh, so uh, that, again, leads to essentially partitioning of the user communities, those who like SPT, those who hate SPT, those who like Spark, those who prefer Hadoop, and so on. So, uh, and the other problem is that host languages often get at least part of the blames uh, for the DSLs they embed. So, in summary, Growable is great for experimentation, for the more adventurous among us, but it demands discipline to remain conform to some standard when you want to use it for large-scale production use. So the second meaning has been a little bit overlooked uh, with all the, uh, the attention on the first one, on this DSLs and Growable, and we can make, uh, put new things on top of Scala. But I think it's even more important in the end. So that Scala is really a language for growth. You can start with a one-liner, you can experiment quickly, and then you can grow without fearing to fall off the cliff, because the same language constructs that helped you write your one-liner still apply when you write your million-line system. It's just objects all the way down and functions all the way down. There's not other things that you have to learn that then kick in for programming in the large say. It's really the same language constructs that scale up from scripts to large systems. And Scala deployments indeed now go into the millions of lines of code. And the best characterization, what, what that means, a large system like that, that I've heard is this one here to say, a large system is one where you do not even know that some of its components exist. So that's, that's the definition of a large system. You don't even know that certain things exist in that system where you work on some part of that. And we will find out what that means for software construction. So the language works indeed for very large programs. The tools are challenged. The larger the code bases get, for instance, the higher the pressure on build times. Uh, and we're working very hard to make the tools catch up. Uh, in the latest version of Scala, for instance, we have dramatically improved incremental build times. And I hope, we hope that this will help a lot of people out there that, that are struggling with the large Scala code bases. So what enables growth? So what is this? Thing that makes Scala enabling growth. So I really do believe it's this rather unique combination of object-oriented and functional. Because large systems that we see out there, they really rely on both. So they generally take to be, tend to be quite disciplined and functional, and that's good. But uh, when you compose in the components, of course, they use all the tricks available in the object-oriented system. Because functional alone doesn't really give you the, uh, the glue, the, uh, the, uh, the composition, the grouping mechanisms for large systems. A problem with that is that there's no established name for this. Should we call this language object functional? Some people have proposed that. But I don't like terms with a slash in them. It reminds me too much of PL1. So, so what do we do? Well, what we would like to do, what we would prefer it to be like this, to have functional and object programming in harmony sitting on the beach. Uh, but in actual reality, it's unfortunately more often like this. That's how many functional people see object-oriented programming. The evil manager that leans over your cubicle and says, well, you haven't written your UML diagram in the right way. And that's how many object-oriented people see functional programming as the, uh, the mad scientist that concocts something that can't lead to any good and probably will threaten the world. <laughs> <coughs> and that's uh, unfortunately where I find uh, Scala often to be. So between the two chairs, falling between the chairs, and getting the blame from both sides. Uh, another quote, which is uh, rather funny, is James Irie's quote uh, that Scala's wrote in role in history. Uh, so James has written this brief, incomplete, and mostly wrong history of programming languages. It's hilarious if you haven't seen that yet. So here's what he writes about Scala. It's the last entry, as far as I know. A drunken Martin Odeski sees a Reese peanut butter cup at fe featuring somebody's peanut butter getting on somebody else's chocolate and has an idea. 
He creates Scala, a language that unifies constructs from both object oriented and functional languages. This pisses off both groups and each promptly declares jihad. So that's amazingly prescient. I didn't, when, when it came out, <laughs> it came, when it came out, I didn't actually, I, I thought it was slightly funny, but uh, now I'm actually not sure whether I should, well, first it's actually true, and second, I, I'm not sure whether it's that funny anymore. But, <laughs> okay. So, so much for functional object oriented. You see, it's a tough, it's a tough area to be in. So, what I would like to propose is actually to slightly shift the viewpoint, or if not the viewpoint, then at least the name we give to this thing. So, uh, another way to view Scala is as a inherently modular language. So what that means is that Scala is still a fusion of object-oriented and functional, but it achieves that to go from small scripts to large systems because it is very modular. So what does modular programming mean exactly? Well, modular programming means simply that systems should be composed from modules, okay? And what are modules? Well, modules should be simple parts that can be combined in many flexible ways to give interesting results. Simple parts that can be combined in many ways. And simple often means encapsulates one functionality, only one. But you could say, well, that's old hat. Modular programming, that's an early 80s phenomenon. We had languages like Modular 2 then, and indeed I'm, I, have a, I have a certain fondness for Modular 2 because that was the first language I programmed uh, seriously in. Uh, and I think, indeed, Modular 2 was great for its time, but these are not the early 80s. Times have changed. In particular, in the early 80s, most languages were, and most computers were uh, von Neumann languages on von Neumann computers. So that means that essentially a computer was a memory and a processor and a bus of one word wide, and the languages reflected that. So they had variables of a simple type or a pointer, both fitted in a, fitted in a word, and uh, your, the whole, every API uh, parameter or function was just one word wide. So to manipulate the system, you had to do it word by word. And at the time, there was already John Backus, the inventor of the first high-level von Neumann language, that was Fortran. When he got the Turing Award in the 70s, he gave a Turing Award lecture, which essentially coined this term, the von Neumann bottleneck, because he says, well, languages have to evolve beyond that, because they have to speak about higher level things, not just single words. They have to speak about uh, graphs and polynomials and texts and things like that. And to do that, you need a mathematical theory of these things. And if you look at mathematics, then those tier theories are always immutable. You never modify something in place in mathematics, and because of that, you need functional programming. So that was sort of the wake-up call for functional programming in the 70s. Okay, so if you believe that, then definitely functional programming is a part of modular programming. And indeed, if you look at the second uh, most important foundational paper for functional programming, then I would say it's this one here, Why Functional Programming Matters, John Hughes, 1985. And his case is clearly a case of modularity. So what John Hughes says is, well, in an imperative program, you have an algorithm, and the, the algorithm he looked at was just a, a newton raphson iteration for square root, could have been any algorithm. You have an algorithm, and it has a loop, and it has an iteration step, and it has a termination condition, and they're all mangled together. What he could do with functional programming is he could split these elements into different modules, functions, that could be combined with a, in a mix and match approach. So he split these apart into separate functions and could combine them. Clear argument to modularity. So does that mean that functional programming is really the same as modular programming? Well, it has, as I said, it helps a lot, but it's not synonymous. synonymous. It's not exactly the same thing. Some concepts in functional languages are at odds in, with modularities. So for instance, sometimes functional languages or some functional languages assume in some uh, areas a global namespace. An example are type classes in Haskell. You can only have one instance for a class in your whole program. And if you uh, remember the definition of uh, what a large system is, you don't even know that certain components exist. That's a problem because you don't know whether the components that you don't know exists might have an implementation of your type class that will conflict with yours. 
And there are other things. Uh, some functional languages have very strong module systems, for instance, SML or OCaml. Other have uh, module systems that are rather weaker, for instance, uh, Haskell or, or Clojure. Let's, let's pick those two. And then you can also discuss whether dynamic typing is actually something that uh, uh, is at odds with modularity because it gives you a weaker way to check your interfaces or not. But that's a completely different discussion and uh, I'd rather steer away from that one. So objects and modules, uh, what, what's their relationship? So in a sense you could say object-oriented languages were sort of the successors of modular languages because there was this idea to say, well, instead of having single modules, let's be more flexible. Let's have classes that can create these things at runtime where we can have an arbitrary number of instances. Let's have traits or interfaces that be, are the APIs of, for, for those so that, that we can have a single module, a single class has multiple interfaces, and the single interface can be implemented by multiple classes. So it was, in a sense, a more flexible way to be modular. But on the other hand, object-oriented doesn't always imply modular either. So for instance, we see, we see uh, things uh, in uh, at least uh, old Ruby uh, monkey patching. I, I'm hearing the Ruby community is steering away from that, so that's very good because monkey patching, of course, is not modular. It has the same problem that you can, of, you can patch the same name only once in your whole program, and if somebody else does, try, tries to do that, you have very weird bugs and very hard to track down problems. Uh, reliance on mutable state uh, is not modular because it gives you a lot of hidden dependencies. And then a lot of mainstream object-oriented languages have rather weak composition and decomposition facilities. So the uh, effects of that is that they then need to rely on external dependency injection frameworks. So that's something that in, pr in principle the modules in your language should do, but if the language can't do it, you need something else that uh, uses aspect-oriented programming or bytecode rewriting. And uh, the, the decomposition facilities often encourage this idea that you should put your methods where your classes are, which sometimes is the right approach, but not always. So I want to come back to Scala and its simple parts. Uh, if we now look what the simple parts are, modules and parts, so they should be simple and they should be combined in flexible ways. Before looking at modules, how Scala can write modules as a library components, let's look at the language itself. What are the simple parts in Scala that can be mixed and matched in a flexible way? He, what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose seven simple building blocks. I sort of took a bit uh, uh, an, an overview of like uh, the, the programs uh, and the classes I wrote uh, in, the, in the past years and says, what are the things I can't do without, what I really rely on? Because of course, when I write code in Scala, I find it rather simple. Uh, uh, you could say, well, of course he does. But uh, uh, I, I still think I, I, want, I want to sort of give you my viewpoint, why I find it simple and what I use, what, where I think that, uh, that things combine well. As always, of course, simple is not the same as easy. Uh, so quoting Rich Hickey here, uh, some people confused, still confuse the two. Easy means it's something that is pretty close to what you already know. It's familiar, and therefore you can quickly adopt it. Simple means something else. Simple means does one thing only and can be combined well. And the two are sometimes the same, but not necessarily so. And uh, a lot of people confuse one for the other. So let's look at the simple parts. And the simple parts are actually rather boring, uh, but they're nevertheless important. So I, I thought it's important that I stress them. So for me, the first thing which uh, is important is uh, expressions and the fact that everything is an expression. So that means I can plug in everything in everything else because an expression, of course, can be a function call or operation and it takes expressions as operands. And because everything is an expression, I, it means that I can compose everything with everything else. If I had a language that had statements and expressions, like many mainstream languages do, I couldn't do that. I would live in one world or in the other. And when I live in the statement world, I have to write these statements one, and the, one after the other, and I have to sort of connect them with mutable variables. So they, they sort of act on these variables. It's a much more indirect and less composable way to treat things. 
So here's just some simple code that shows how that works. So the if uh, else uh, has the same syntax as in Java, but it's an expression. This thing will give you a string, grown up or minor. And the same thing happens uh, for uh, match uh, expressions, which are the analog of switch uh, in, in C or Java. And tries and all the other forms of statements that you would usually see are expressions. And that means they can be put inside each other and can be nested. Good, so that was number one. Number two for me would be this principle of nesting scopes. So everything in Scala can be nested inside everything else, and there's a static scoping discipline. And that's, again, very important for just be able to refactor programs freely. So in Scala, you can write a method inside a method. In Java, you can't do that. You can't write methods inside methods, but you can write a class inside a method and then a method inside the inner class. So if there's a single class in between, then you're OK. So if I would write a class here, I'm OK, but I can't nest directly. Why? There's no, re no good reason why. Uh, it's just the way it is, right? But it's a big impediment to actually structure your programs freely. Uh, so in Scala, there are two namespaces, terms, oops, terms and types. And they have exactly the same rule for each one. Uh, whereas in other languages, like again, quoting Java, you have four namespaces, fields, methods, classes, packages, and you have different resolution rules for each one. So just to say, that's sort of a difference between simple and easy. I think the, Scala, the Java rules are for someone who comes from Java easy, because that's what you're used to. So you don't see the complexity in all this. But it's far from being simple. It's rather complex. Four namespaces, different rules for each. OK, so what this principle leads to is actually a, quite a powerful principle to simplify your programs. So the first tip I give everyone who says, well, how can I get on the right track on writing clean Scala code is you shouldn't pack too much in an expression. It's a rookie mistake for people who are new to functional programming. Uh, because you can pack things in an expression, often people do. So that's actually code I saw in our code base. Uh, it's a single expression. It does, uh, has an amazing amount of functionality. But it doesn't mean that you have to do it that way. So just for the sake of it, I, I said, well, let's, uh, let's just refactor this thing, uh, see what we get. So here's uh, the same expression. But now I have, uh, I have just factored out all the meaningful intermediate results. So it's, you see we actually pr produce a set of sources. And then we have a workspace root. And then we have a function which says for a given entry, which is a set of files, uh, we uh, give you uh, the, the files that correspond to the entry. And then what we do in the end, we uh, iterate over all the sources. And for each one of them, we get the files that correspond to the entry, and we concatenate them all together. If you don't know the, the vocabulary, of course, this might still look complicated to you. But anybody who has sort of a, a superficial knowledge of Scala for them, definitely this would be much more legible than the thing I've showed you before. And the important thing is that, yes, I can do that. I can write valves, so just uh, local definitions. But I can also write functions that get called all, only on demand. And I can put them right where my result expressions is. I don't have to pollute my enclosing class. So that makes it very easy and uh, really a no-brainer to do precisely this thing. If your language didn't let you do that, and you'd have a choice to say, oh, I have to create a new method in my class to factor this thing out, but then I have to pass a lot of parameters to it, and I have to write a document, and my whole thing will be much, much bigger, then there's a trade-off. And you will be sort of more pushed towards writing very long methods that uh, have, a, have a soup of loops or long expressions or things like that. So that was number two, nesting, I think, is very important. Number three is patterns and case classes, or decomposition and composition. So uh, here's a, a classical example of that. Uh, so if you want to have a tree, syntax tree, that represents arithmetic expressions, then you would have a base trait called expression. And then, then you would have two classes, one for numbers and one for plus, that both ex extend the base trait. And they have the parameters that you expect. So number gets an int, and plus gets two expressions. That's the two operands of the, of the plus. And then somewhere else, in a different module, at a different time, you can write an evaluation method if you want. And the evaluation method would simply say, well, let's, let's look at what we have here. If it's a number, let's return the m. If it's a plus, 
then let's evaluate recursively the two sub-expressions and sum them. So that's simple and flexible. Uh, functional uh, programming aficionados coming from ML or Haskell would probably say it's too verbose. Uh, it can be done more concisely in Haskell or ML, and that's true because Haskell and ML have special types for these things called algebraic data types. We've chosen not to do that because A, we want it to stay simple and uniform. Everything in Scala is a class. There's not a separate set of types that express these things. And second, because I don't think in actual code it matters that much. Because if you compare the size of your type definitions with the size of everything you do with them, then I would believe in every program the types are really a tiny minority. So optimizing on the types isn't, isn't, isn't worth that much. So if you look at the, the traditional object-oriented alternative for that, uh, it would, of course, be this one here. So here we now say, well, uh, because we don't have pattern matching, it's actually very awkward to figure out what the class is. We'd have to use an is instance of or as instance of for a visitor pattern or things like that. Everything is rather clumsy and heavyweight. What we would typically do is to say, well, let's put eval in the trait expression itself. And then in our number class uh, I, and in my plus class, I have the right implementations of eval. And that's OK if that's what your application domain is. That means that uh, if you have a set of uh, types, uh, a domain model, and you know already exactly what you want to do with it. Namely, I have expressions to evaluate them and maybe to pretty print them. But uh, I'm sure there won't be anything else. On the other hand, you have often situations where the data model is given, maybe from a database schema or an interchange format or something like that, and you don't know what you want to do with it. And it might change next year. And then the object-oriented uh, approach here is actually the wrong one, because you have to sort of touch all these things all the time to change your business logic, where what you really should be doing is have a pure data model that's fixed and stable and put your business logic elsewhere. In functional programming and pattern matching, uh, uh, you, you have the choice. You can do one or the other. Of course, choice is always uh, something that uh, is also a responsibility for you. You have to make the choice, but I think in this case, it's actually very, very important, very good, because there is no best default. It really depends on your application. So number four uh, for me would be recursion. Uh, that's, uh, of course, we all know what recursive functions are. Uh, they are sort of everywhere. But in imperative programs, they're rather underused. People use rather loops instead uh, and use variables for that. And uh, in functional languages, what people usually do at first is to replace a loop with combinators like map and flat map and filter and things like that. And that's great. That's exactly the right approach that you should be doing. But on the other hand, there's always a time when your combinator library just doesn't have what you need to do. So you need a fallback. You need a fallback to say, well, what if my combinators really don't give me the right vocabulary? And then the fallback in functional programming, I think, is really great to have this idea of uh, uh, recursion, in particular tail recursive functions that, with, that can simulate by a very systematic way any state machine you can throw up with, uh, you can come up with, and uh, that do so, in particular, very efficiently. So that's the other thing, that sometimes you're concerned that all your higher level operators, uh, they might actually cost you too much. Uh, in general, they're plenty fast enough. But it could be that you are faced with essentially a hotspot where you say, well, I have to squeeze every last cycle out of it. And then it's, it's great that you can specialize by hand. And re recursive functions, in particular, tail recursive functions, they're sort of the natural evolution of what you would use a loop for in imperative languages. So now that I've said that, then of course the, uh, the, the number five that you definitely will use a lot in functional programming is function values. Uh, so that one is pretty uncontroversial by now. You could say almost all the languages out there have some form of uh, function values. Uh, sometimes they get the scope rules a little bit wrong, like uh, this, uh, uh, the, the meaning of this in JavaScript closures is a little bit funky. But uh, by and large, it's, it's the right thing. And that's great. Number six for me would be collections. So collections definitely are the backbone of programming. And in functional languages, we have 
immutable collections as our default, so persistent collections, uh, that uh, where your program is then a transformer from collections to collections. So it takes collections, it produces new collections, and it's not a CRUD program, a create, read, update, delete program that pokes into collections element by element. And Scala has a very nice library of immutable collections, uh, which happens to be very, very simple to use. And it's simple to use in particular because it has a single vocabulary of powerful operations, such as map or filter, and they apply to any collection that you could think of that out there, including collections that you write yourself. So here's a little example in action. So we have an array of uh, people, an array of persons, and we map the uh, function that takes the name of the person uh, over the array of people. So that's, uh, that's essentially a screenshot of a worksheet, Scala worksheet. So you, write, you type expressions on the left, and you get here the types and the answers that the uh, Scala uh, REPL would throw back at you. So this thing is integrated in the Eclipse IDE, and IntelliJ has a very similar thing. So I would respond to say, well, uh, I go back with an, with an array of string. You get back an array of string, and it's Bob and Carla. Uh, you could do the same thing with sets. So we have a set of 1, 4, 5, 7, and you could map it by saying, well, uh, apply a division by 2 to each operand. So that's the uh, 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 canonical map over sets, and you would get a set of 0, 2, 3. Note that the size of the set is different, and that's correct because sets are not sequences. If you map as a, have a map over a set, then uh, it's something different than a map over a sequence. The important thing is the concept of map is exactly the same. It's a mathematical concept here. And here we have a third one, uh, a map, actually, of Roman numerals. So it maps the characters to the corresponding numbers. And what that map here does, it reverts that, it inverts this map here. So it swaps, essentially, the key and value pairs. So here you have a key L and a value D, and you return a value D and a key L. And what's important here is, in every case, the result is of exactly the same type as what you started with, no friction. So if I work in sets, I want my map to apply to sets. I don't want to convert to sequences, iterate, and then convert back. That would be essentially three operations instead of one. So really, the, the maximal simplicity that you could have here. So I'm sort of making the case for this form of collections because it has actually been criticized a lot in the past. So I want to sort of give you the counter argument why I still think it's the right way to use collections like this. So the counter arguments are essentially two, but I'm only presenting one here. Uh, the, the, the counter argument that you hear sometimes is to say, oh, the type of map is so complicated. Uh, well, let's look at the type of map. Here's what you see in the Scala doc. Uh, it's uh, a function. It takes a function from A to B. So that's the Scala doc for, array, for uh, the type array of A. And it gives you back an array of B. That's what you would expect, right? Well, the problem here is that it's, uh, there's a thing which says use case. And that's sort of a red flag which to say, well, that's actually not the real type. That's the type you see as a user of arrays, which actually should be the only type that matters for you. Because as a user of arrays, you want to see that type. So what's the real type? Well, let's uh, open this thing up, the use case. And here you see the full signature of map. And it is rather intimidating. So you have a, a second type parameter, that. And you have an implicit parameter uh, of type can build from. It says, well, if you start with an array of t and you have a type b, then uh, you can, uh, uh, you, and, and, and you have a recipe to build from an array of t and a b, a type of that, then that's a result. So that's something that is very, very abstract and indirect. But the reason why we have this type is uh, that we want to have only a single implementation, or in principle, a single implementation of map in the whole collection libraries. Before we had this, ty this type, we didn't do that. We had like 20 different implementations of map, one for arrays and one for lists and things like that. And the problem with that was that often these implementations, they diverged. Some of them were buggy, others were not. Some of them, some, sometimes people would implement a new method on a certain form collection, then it was missing from the others. Sometimes the same functionality was, was present on different collections under different names because different developers found that they needed the same thing. So, we, so essentially, we said, no, stop all that. What we need is a very strict framework that has a single 
implementation of map for the whole thing. And then, then it would work automatically for all the collections. And to actually be able to do that, you need something as flexible as that, uh, which uh, you'll see in a second. So the counter argument would be, well, why didn't we define map, the global map, like this? So we said uh, these collections, they are functors. So functors are essentially things that have a map. And if you look up the, the type that you would expect here, and a functor is uh, uh, the type of map would be very much that, like the first type that you saw. So it takes uh, the new type, uh, the old element type T and the new element type U, and it gives you an F of U, where F is essentially your constructor, your type that, uh, that you parameterize over. That's the functor. Well, the problem with that is that that map doesn't work for arrays, since uh, to build a new array on the JVM, you need a class tag. And there's no way we can smuggle a class tag into the signature. It's just not possible. It works over all types, not just types that have class tags. So it won't work that way. Would it work for sets? No, I'm afraid it wouldn't work for sets either, because to build a new set, you need a way to compare the elements of that set to avoid duplicates. And again, there's no way you can actually smuggle in an element comparison function into that map. So the reason for can build from is it's essentially a uh, generalized way to express all these collection-specific constraints. You say you would have an instance of can build from to say that would itself demand, well, for sets, if you give me an equality, I can build a set. The array can build from would say, if you give me a class tag, I can build you an array. And that's essentially the sort of the generic glue that you find in the collection libraries. As a user, you never see that. So it's actually uh, quite, quite miraculous that all this clever machinery that builds the right collection for you at runtime uh, actually doesn't leak out into the signatures. That's why I'm actually very fond of can build from. So number seven and last would be variables. Uh, oops, aren't variables anti-functional? Yeah, they are. And aren't variables anti-modular? Well, if you, over, if you overuse them and misuse them, yes. Uh, global mutable state often leads to hidden dependencies between objects, and that's very, very bad. On the other hand, I think part of the appeal and attraction that Scala has for me is that it's this rather cute way to combine mutable state with functions. And if you do that cleverly and wisely, you can get great benefits from that. So I looked at where, in my last project, where did I actually use state? So my last project was a, is a new uh, compiler for Scala called .c. And uh, that compiler is, in principle, it's a functional program. It's very close to a complete functional architecture. And the concern for, for doing that is, um, on the one hand, it's nice, it's very clean. The concern, of course, is uh, will not that be slow? And uh, the idea of this compiler is a, it's a compiler that should be much, much faster than current Scala C. So a slow compiler is not what we wanted. But on the other hand, there's a nice thing to say, well, if your program is purely functional, then it actually gives you a lot of new optimization possibilities, okay, uh, opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise. The first one is caching, that you say, well, if you have a function, it's a pure function, it will give you, give you the same result every time you apply it to the same arguments. Well, if the function is expensive, it means that you can actually cache that. You can memorize the function. It says, well, uh, the first time I applied the function, I put the arguments and the result in a map. And the second time I need the function again, I look up the map to do that. That could be a big speed up, depending on how fast uh, or slow your function is. Uh, but caching is an art by itself, so you can't imagine, you can't uh, assume that your language will do it all for you because it will you just give a single, single version of caching, and that's often not good enough. So what I actually found in the compiler is that the lazy vowels that the language gives us, but then there are the memoized functions, and sometimes you put them in a normal map, sometimes in a weak map, depending on retention policies. Uh, there are interned names, uh, so that's so, sort of like string intern, but for our own structures. And there are even LRU caches, to, because here we wanted to bound the size of a cache to prevent it to, from, 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 from growing too large. So all these things are rather sophisticated uses of state that, in the end, remain completely hidden. The fact that you cache your program aggressively doesn't change the semantics of your program at all. It's still a purely functional program, even though it uses a lot of state in the caches internally. And uh, we can verify that by, because we can actually turn these things on and off by configuration. And they've, they've, 
that, that, that way we can actually verify that the program runs just as, just as well and with the same result, albeit much, much slower if we turn the caches off. Um, the second one uh, usage that I found was persisting. So that uh, idea is that if you have a value in a map, uh, at some point, often the value stabilizes. So the value, the, the, the map won't change anymore. The, the, that, the, that value for that key will always stay the same in the rest of the program. And then the, you might get an efficiency uh, improvement if you remove the value from the map and put it in the object right there because the access is faster and you don't have the, the problem of leaking memory that you have in a map. So that was number two. Again, it's unobservable if you choose your time when you want to persist correctly. Uh, third one was copy on write. So there, these, uh, the compiler has untyped trees. So that's essentially the, the, the task of a type checker is it takes a syntax tree and it doesn't have types and it produces a syntax tree and it does have types. And uh, in the current Scala C compiler, uh, essentially we did that by mutation. So these syntax trees, they have a slot for types and then there's a, some sort of traversal that puts a type in the slot. And that putting types in the slot, of course, is something imperative. Um, that's sort of the traditional way it's been done in compilers so far. But it's not the purely functional way, because you can't just put types in these slots. So what you want to do is, of course, you want to transform these immutable trees to uh, type trees. Uh, and there would be two different data structures. The problem with that, again, is performance, because these trees are very, very large. Uh, these trees are typically the largest data, data constructs in, your, in, in a compiler. So to copy them all. Uh, just to add a type field is inefficient. And there you observe, well, if you start with untyped trees and there's this type field sitting there, then the first time you sort of want to give a type to the tree, you might as well reuse the tree you started with. And of course, the second time you see this tree in a different context and you say, well, now that untyped tree has a different type, you shouldn't overwrite your type. That would be an observable side effect. So at that point, what we do is copy on write. You say, oh, copy on second write. There's a different type that you want to associate it with the same unimmutable tree at that point, but only at that point, let's copy the tree. Again, it's a rather sophisticated use of imperative state that's not observable. And finally, there are fresh values, so fresh names and unique IDs. Uh, and uh, uh, if you, that's, that's also something that uh, you, is, is pretty, pretty standard. So you have to uh, generate fresh names, and that means you have just a global counter that you update uh, uh, and uh, that, you, that gives you an, an, a number that you add to your name, and unique IDs will work the same way. And if you've, done the, if you've done all that, then actually it turns out that we're left with exactly two variables. The two variables give you the current constraint for type checking, so essentially what my constraints is for type inference, and the current uh, diagnostics, so the error log, so when I write errors. And it turns out that this state uh, needs to be versioned, so there's essentially a tree of possible explorations where you can backtrack and things like that. So it needs to be very strictly controlled. Okay. Now you could say, well, all these are interesting uses of state, which you could hide, but the last one you couldn't. That's really sort of the essence, the essential state in, in a type checker. So uh, shouldn't you use a monad for that? So that's sort of the classical functional approach nowadays. If you have state, encapsulate it in a monad. Well, if you have a look at that, then that's what we would have to do. So that's what we do now. So that's two of the core operations that we deal with. There's this operation type, which takes an untyped tree and an expected type and gives you a type tree. And there's an operation is subtype, to pick another example, which takes two types and says, uh, gives you back a Boolean, whether one type is a subtype of the other. So I just pick in this, I mine the real code base. That's sort of the two most fundamental operations that I have here. So in the monadic approach, because both of these things can produce uh, new constraints and type can produce new errors, I would have to put them in the typer state monad. So that means the result now is a typer state of whatever else they returned before. And under the covers, a typer state is, in principle, the result that you return and the new state consisting of these two variables. But you hide it in this, in this state. You hide the state in the monad in the monad construction. OK, so if you do that, then here's the typical use case, use, usage example. So what we would write now, pre-monadic, in pre-monadic code, something like that, uh, where you say, well, let's see whether the sub, uh, type T1 is a subtype of the type T2, and the type T2 is a subtype of the type T3, and if yes, then return some result. 
With monads, of course, you can't do that because the result of a subtype wouldn't be a Boolean anymore. It would be a type state of Boolean. So what you would have to do is you have to, you'd have to pull out the type state. Uh, you'd have to pull out, sorry, the Boolean from the type state and deal with it afterwards. And Scala has a very convenient syntactic sugar for that, for these monadic things, which is a for expression. It maps into map and flat map operation. And you can use it for any monad, uh, any monad that has map and flat map, which, is, which are all monads. So it would look like that. But the question you'd have to ask for yourself, well, how is this better? This is definitely uh, longer. You could argue it's more imperative because I, I see something that smells like statements here, right? So things that, operations that return results. So in a sense, I'm back to, to, to imperative programming only on a monadic level. And third, it still doesn't do, or uh, in, in the naive uh, setting, it still doesn't do what I want because definitely here, if the first is subtype is false, I wanna immediately return false, not do the second one. Uh, and I think I can, I can rig up the monad with laziness that that's true here, but it's not the thing that you would immediately, uh, immediately do and that would be very simple or efficient to do. So for me, the important thing of functional programming is not so much that we hide things in monads, but the important thing was this. We reduced the state to two vars. We were very, very economical with the vars. With the vars. We, 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 before introducing one, you really think hard about it. Do you need that? Why do you need that? How do you version it? That's the important part. The, whether then afterwards you say, well, I put this in behind essentially a type wall like a monad is, is secondary and there are sort of practical considerations whether sometimes that's a good idea and sometimes it is, a, it is not. So I think actually this question of typing and monads are a part of that. It's very much a, tra a question of trade-offs. So I believe all these are fine languages and none of them is right in their approach necessarily. So you could choose to say, well, I don't really want to talk about types at all in my language, uh, at, at statically, at compile time. I don't, all the compiler does is essentially uh, is, is a syntax checker that verifies that my syntax makes sense. Or I could say, well, I talk about types in the traditional sense, arguments and results of functions, and I have a very flexible type system and a very uh, precise type system that let you, let, lets me express that. Or I could go further and say, well, I want to also talk about side effects like state, what what state modifications do I have? What I.O. modifications do I have? And then when you do that, then you have the, the Haskell language. Uh, or I could uh, go in a different direction and I said, well, I also want to talk about properties of values, like whether this value is the same as that value or this value is in a given interval. And then you get a language with dependent typing like Idris. Or you could go all the way and say, I want to talk about total correctness. So with my program, I want to have a correctness proof of my program. And then you have something like an interactive theorem prover like Koch or Isabel. And all these are valid approaches. None of them is right. None of them is better than the other. And it's always a practical argument until what to what degree do your types help you more than they hinder you by introducing, introducing additional boilerplate and additional um, um, restrictions uh, in, in the way you can code. And uh, definitely, most programs aren't written as quickly in Coq as they are written in Clojure. So there's also a, a speed argument and a productivity argument. And Scala, what Scala's type system really is, it's very, essentially, it's firmly here. <coughs> So Scala's types are rather refined, but they're refined. The, the idea of having refined types is not so much to be able to express a lot of properties with them, at least not right now. I think uh, we might go there in the future. Uh, so, but it's rather to say, well, we have a very flexible alternative for languages that uh, don't use types, that are dynamically typed. So we want to say, well, we want, we want to have a language where the types are flexible enough and expressive enough so that they're not a big burden for people who might otherwise have chosen a dynamically typed language. That's why the type system in Scala is rather refined. And uh, the, the idea that we can actually move it there is an interesting one, but I wouldn't emphasize it right now. So I think that over the next five years or so, there will be exciting new developments in effects to, to, to express effects. There are algebraic effects. That's a very active research topic. There are several other research on effects. And I believe in five years, probably we'll come to the conclusion that no, monads are not the right way to talk about effects. Uh, so that's also why I, I would be very hesitant to use monads for effects right now. Good. So 
uh, I quickly go through the rest uh, uh, forms of modules. So we've seen seven simple parts of Scala. Uh, and uh, how can these parts then be combined to write modules in the user code? In fact, I believe that modules, uh, if we talk about modules that take a large number of forms, so I'm very uh, open to different ways to write a module. Module could be a function, could be an object, could be a class, that means a template in which you can have many objects. It could be an actor. Uh, it could be a stream transform. It could be a microservice. So it depends on what you want as long as a module is something that is simple and where the, I, the focus lies on the way modu the module can be combined with others, for me, it's a module. So a module is something that exists primarily to be combined with other things and less in isolation for what it can do. So Scala is a fairly modular language. Its modular roots are modular too. I mentioned that already. It's the first language I programmed in int intensively and the first I wrote a compiler for a long time ago. Uh, modular 3 was also a very interesting language, introduced universal subtyping. Haskell, uh, from Haskell, Scala picked this idea of type classes which, and made them more modular by transplanting them into uh, implicit parameters. And I believe the biggest influence and the initial announcement uh, on the first slide really pointed to that was SML modules. So Scala really inherits a lot of ideas from SML modules as a rather direct correspondence to say what SML calls a structure, we call an object. A functor is a class with parameters. A signature is a trait. Abstract types are the same. And what SML calls a sharing constraint, we call a refinement. So the features that Scala has for modular programming, I believe, are first uh, uh, a rather rich type system that gives us the vocabulary uh, to talk about the things that go in and out of modules. Then I believe static typing is a very important tool to verify encapsulation. Then you have the, uh, essentially the core abstractions for modules, objects, so that's essentially an atomic module, a class that can be parameterized and be exist in many instances, and a trait that essentially gives you a slice of module uh, uh, of a module API, uh, and that can be essentially combined with mixing composition with other slices. So classes is parameterized, traits are slicing, and then there are abstract types, and abstract types are uh, a very powerful way to to, to abstract things to make them more generic, more general. So a good example here is a graph library, uh, where, uh, which is actually amazingly hard to do that uh, in, a, in a truly generic way. So here's uh, something that we had in recently in the ACM communications in a paper where we had our own step at producing a graph library. So what we would do here is to say, well, there's a trait, graphs, which says, well, I'm talking about graphs now. And talking about graphs means I have to have a type of nodes and a type of edges. But I don't know what they are. They could be anything, uh, nodes and edges. Uh, I only know that I have an operation predecessor that given an edge gives you back a node and successor is the same thing. And then I have a graph, which is again an unknown type. It could have any implementation, uh, but I know it has these methods. So that's this graph sig upper bound of graph. So I, I know for a graph I can f find out what are the set of nodes, what are the set of edges, for a given node, what are the set of outgoing and incoming edges? And finally, the set of sources, the set of sources of a graph. So that's my, essentially, to establish my vocabulary to say, well, that's what we are going to talk about now. And then if we want to write a simple graph model, then that's what we could do. We could now say, well, inherit the straight graphs and slot in the type of graph. So here with the type of graph was something that I haven't told you. I just told you it will support these methods. So what we say here is now we have a concrete class and it has some nodes and it has some edges which I pass as parameters and here are obvious, albeit very inefficient implementations of the three remaining methods. So there's a powerful principle here uh, at work and that's when, when I start with this, uh, I have several, I have many things which are abstract. I have nodes, edges, predecessor, successor, and graph. At any point, I can say, well, now I know certain things, and I define those, and I no, don't, still don't know other things, and I 
just leave them abstract. Just define what you know, leave abstract what you don't. It's a very powerful principle that in Scala works universally for everything, values, methods, and types. So in this abstract model, I still haven't told you what a node and what an edge is, but I don't have to. Uh, it, it, it works exactly the same way. So if I want to uh, give you the concrete types of nodes and edges, then that's what I could do. I could give you a concrete model, again, extends graphs. And here I now say, well, a node, is, let's say it's a social graph, it's a person, and an edge is a pair of persons. And here are the implementations of successor and predecessor. So that's just one particular instantiation of that, which I can mix freely with my abstract graph model. And that gives me the complete implementation. So what's interesting here is that the same principle can be used for encapsulation. So arguably, that's a case of encapsulation. There's a type node, but I don't tell you what it is. And parameterization. So here, I've given you the type in the concrete model. So that's what I would usually do under the, the, the name of parameter. So it's a very powerful principle that you can mix those two. So talking about parameterization, generics, of course, is a staple of uh, typed languages now. Everybody has it. And so has Scala. So parameterized types uh, is very important. Uh, there's this sticky point of variance, uh, which I probably, uh, if you have written Scala, you know what that is. It depends how whether a set, a list of apples is also a list of fruit or not. Uh, if apple is a fruit, then it's a list of apples, a list of fruit. So in Scala, similar to C sharp, we express that by annotating the declaration point with a plus here for covariant, uh, whereas uh, other languages like Java would uh, force you to do that at the usage point, and that typically uh, gets more complicated. One interesting bit here is actually that the two things, parameterization and abstract types, can be combined, or more precisely, parameters can be mapped into abstract types. And one other interesting bit is that that actually explains what this variance thing is about. So uh, just to show you what that is, uh, parameters can be mapped into abstract members, whether they are types or values, doesn't matter, and arguments then are refinements. So let's have a look at how that works. So here we have our class set. And I would say, well, instead of parameterizing it, let me just give you a type field here. So it's, it has a type, and I mangle the name slightly because I don't want to essentially produce, uh, produce a name conflict if several classes are parameterized with T. So then a set of string would be a set where now I define what this type is, type T equals string. So that shows that this thing here can be treat it as syntactic sugar for that thing here. My language gets simpler. Uh, then uh, for lists, I would do the same thing. But because lists are covariant, a list of number actually is a list where my type t is a number or a subtype of that. Because lists of integers are also possible as lists of numbers, and that means my element type is actually just a subtype of number. So it gives me a rather nice way to express a lot of different features and map it into a common core. OK, and number seven and uh, last one would be implicit parameters. Uh, so implicit parameters uh, were sort of initially thought to be a poor man's type classes. That was my first characterization for them, to say, well, Haskell has classes and type classes and instances. And we have all these things in object-oriented languages. So all we need to get type class functionality is implicit parameters. So in, indeed, they can model that. So here you would have a minimum operation that works for all things that are ordered. So you just need to give an ordering. And that's implicit. So the compiler will do it for you. And you can then express a minimum, a minimum operation over that set. But they actually can express a lot more than just type classes. So for instance, they ex can express a context. Uh, so a context is something that essentially everybody should get to see. And sometimes it changes. But most of the time, you, 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 it, you, you keep it the same. So at some point, the context changes. But most of the time, it, it, it's the same. And that's, again, a very useful use of implicit parameters. That, by the way, is uh, that's how I nowadays do dependency injection. I think that's, that's the ideal way to do that uh, this way. And finally, it can express a capability where you say, for instance, if I need to access a customer ID, then I need some admin rights. Uh, so I need to demand that as a parameter. And again, it makes sense to make that parameter implicit because if I have admin rights and you need them and I call your operations, then that's all we need to know. The precise way in which I pass this parameter to you is boring and cluttering. 
the, the important thing is I have it, you need it, and that means we can pass the capability along and that's okay. Okay, so to summarize, simple parts, uh, everything is an expression, everything can be nested, compose and match with pattern matching, recurse function values, immutable collections and vars. For me, that's it. That's the seven things that we can keep in our heads that re represent the, the core of what I see as Scala. And in the modules, we have the things that I talked about. So the other parts, there's actually much more to Scala than that. Uh, and a lot gets written about the much more parts. Uh, there are things like implicit conversions, existential types, structural types, higher kind of types, macros. And all these things, for me, they are far from being the simple core. They're not the simple core. And in fact, if you look closely, then they're not even in the core language because to enable any of these things, you need a language feature flag. So you have to say, for instance, import language.existentials before you can use these existential types. And my advice would be, well, don't. Just avoid them unless you, have a, unless you have a clear use case. Often the use case is you want to use Scala as a DSL for some other language. And that's OK. But if you want to say, well, what is the core of functional programming in Scala? What's the core of modular programming in Scala? Then that's not necessarily it. OK, thank you.